Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. As we get started, uh, we pray that you would work in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you are here. And Lord, we thank you that you want to work in spite of us. As Paul would say to this church in the second epistle, who is sufficient for these things? But our sufficiency is of Christ. You like to take people and use them for your glory. And Lord, if you can use a church like Corinth, several thousand years later, we're being encouraged by the fact that in spite of some of their issues, you wanted to use them. Then how much more, Lord, can we be encouraged you want to use us in this generation that has lost an idea of what is right, is so confused as to what is lovely, what is honorable, what is pure, that, Lord, they need people to be salt and light. So we pray that you'd work in us in such a way that your name would be glorified. They would see our good works and they would give glory and honor to our Father in heaven who loved us and redeemed us by sending his Son to take our place. Thank you for forgiving us our sins. Thank you for taking the wrath away from us through your Son and giving to us who believe eternal life. Be with us and open your word to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, a little reminder. According to the grace which is given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Another builds thereupon, chapter 3, verse 10. Let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, obvious, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, as he had been warning them about those who had had different teachers they preferred, Paul, Apollos, Peter. For all things are yours, whether of Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. What's missing? Past. Why is past not mentioned? When you receive Christ as your Savior, your past has been atoned for through the death and resurrection of Christ. What you have now with God is present and future. And he is sufficient even for our errors in our present and our future. But our past is under the blood, which means you're free. Jesus said you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Listen, your position in Christ this morning, if you've had him in your heart by faith, you've received him, you are free. You're free of the pain and the hurt and the things that have been done to you at some point in your life. Or, or perhaps even today, the anger, the unforgiveness, the things that you may struggle with. Or different areas that used to run your life and are trying to get a hold of you again. You're free. He sets you free. So be free. Ask for his power. He'll take it away, those things that try to pull you back. You're free. You're Christ's. And Christ is God's. So chapter 4. Let a man so account of us, logosomai from Romans 4, direct the positive, if you remember that study, same word. Let a man account of us as of the minister's servants, the idea is under rowers of Christ, as stewards, household manager, someone in charge of a, a house or stewardship, stewards of the mysteries of God. Now we've talked about the mysteries, right? Is that something you can't know? 
No, it's something previously not fully understood or unknown that is now being revealed. And so we went through that, like Psalm 2. Here's this psalm that the Messiah will come and reign, that he is the Son of God, that he'll be placed on the holy hill in Jerusalem. Better make peace with him by embracing him and receiving him. And so a psalm in the Old Testament that they would read and wonder, is this messianic? Now we know clearly in the New Testament is all about Jesus. So these mysteries are very important, and I want to consider some of these things for a minute. As stewards of the mysteries of God, some will say to you, how do you know you can trust the Bible? After all, isn't it written by men? How many have heard that one? And you go, no, it's not. I'd like to give you a little more than that. Turn to Isaiah chapter 45. Let's look at a couple things for a minute. Isaiah 45. Let's start with verse so 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you that are escaped of the nations, and have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image, idols, Isaiah 45, 20. That was a left turn, by the way, in case you were waiting for that. Pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from the ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. That's a major statement. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. Here he is again with it. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto, unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Wow. Look also at chapter 46 verse 5 of Isaiah. To whom will you liken me? God goes on. He was telling us he's the only one. To whom will you liken me and make me equal <clears throat> and compare me that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver in the balance. They hire goldsmiths and he maketh a God. And they fall down and they worship. Yea, they bear him upon their shoulder. They carry him, that is their God, set him in his place and he standeth from his place. He shall not remove. Yea, one shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer. Because he's just a block of wood with gold on it. Nor save him out of his trouble. Remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. You get the sense he's trying to tell us something? I am God and there is none like me. Well, okay, fine. How do we know you're God and there's none else? Here's the test. Declaring the end from the beginning. Prophecy. Prophecy is God's authentication. You internet shoppers, when you wait to see the little browser lock or HTTPS, okay, now it's encrypted. Now I know I'm going right to the server. That's, this is God's authentication. Prophecy. How do I know I've got the real deal here? How do I know I'm really getting true word of God? How do I know that he is the only God? There is none else. Simple. He'll tell us the end from the beginning. Prophecy. These mysteries of Christ. And what's yet coming? Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Keep that in mind. He will tell us things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. I'll tell you things not yet done. Did he tell us Messiah would be crucified? Yes, beat with a scourge, pierced in his hands and his feet, lanced with a sword, die, died between the wicked, buried with the rich, rise again. Right, got all that. But how about the last days? One of the major signs that the world is in the last days came from the prophet Ezekiel. We won't turn there, but you can write it down and look at it later. Ezekiel chapter 37. Chapter 36, Israel will rebloom. It is. 
Chapter 37, God is going to bring the Jews who like dead bones are scattered around the world. And he prophesied to Ezekiel, son of man, can these be bones be made to live again? Ezekiel very wisely said, Lord, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't. And so he began to prophesy. The bones came back together, the tendons, the sinews, the, the muscle, the meat, all these other things in the skin. And eventually the breath of God came in and they rose up and God prophesied through Ezekiel that the nation, those scattered would once again be regathered to the land. And again, the spirit of God would move in them. 1948, they started coming back officially. Interesting, Isaiah, same prophet, turn to chapter 66 in Isaiah here, since we're still in it. Isaiah 66, not only will Israel be regathered, not only will they come from all over the world, which is literally being fulfilled and has been fulfilled. In fact, more Jews are leaving Europe. Can you guess why? If you've been watching the news, you know exactly why. But look at Isaiah chapter 66. Before Zion travailed, Israel, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child, 66-7. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. May 14th, 1948, 4.30 p.m., David Ben-Gurion proclaimed Israel a nation. They were born in a day. This was prophesied almost 2,700 years before it happened. A nation would be born in a day. They'll be back in the land. They'll be born in a day. Okay, well, coincidence. Turn to Daniel chapter 12 to the right. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Move to the right. I skip Lamentations, but you saw it on the way by. Daniel chapter 12. Remember, declaring things that are not yet happened. Yes? yes. Nation born in a day. Took till 1948. Another little proof text for you scientific people. One of the oldest books of the Bible, God said to Job, have you seen the springs of the sea? People laughed at that until 1977 when we finally got mini sub technology good enough to go down far enough to find freshwater springs in the bottom of the sea. He tells us the things that have not yet come to pass. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. You, Daniel, shut up the words of this prophecy. Seal the book even till the time of the end. Okay. Great, it's till the time of the end. How do we know when that comes? Many shall run to and fro. They will travel all over the world. Today, global travel, what? Commonplace. Secondly, knowledge shall be increased. How many remember when your parents leased their phone from the phone company? How many are old enough to remember you picked up the phone in some cases and said to the operator, may I have Mitchell 35926? How many remember that day? Or the trucks used to have MI3 or Mitchell 3 instead of 64. How many remember? And you know what was really maddening? No matter how fast you, it still went. Wasn't that maddening? If you don't know what that is, Google it. Now we have things in our pockets. Incredibly advanced in one generation. Knowledge shall be increased. Those who study such things are saying it is growing in the current generation exponentially, especially in the medical and biotech fields. How do we know in the last days? Israel back in the land, nation born in a day, people traveling all over the world, which back in those days, you hardly left your hamlet or your village. In Israel, because you were required, you went down to Jerusalem, but most people stayed put. Information exploding. What age are we in? The information age. Okay, another thing coming, global government. Turn to Daniel 7, since you're in Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Again, things not yet come. Daniel was prophesying there'd be a fourth kingdom. It started with the Roman Empire in chapter 7, verse 23. It would be diverse from all kingdoms. It would devour the whole earth. The Romans did a good job of this. Tread it down, break it in pieces. But this is something that has not yet come. Ten horns will come out of that former kingdom. This kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, reign contemporaneously, shall rise and reign together, and another will rise after them. He'll be diverse from the first. He'll subdue three kings. He'll blaspheme, speak words against the Most High God. He'll wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High. Think to change times and laws. They shall be given to his hand until time, times, and the dividing of a time. 3.5 years. But judgment 
shall, shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That kingdom's not yet here. God's going to establish his kingdom. And just before it will be a wicked kingdom. In a time when Israel's back in the land, when knowledge increases and people travel to and fro. So we're going to see a final global government. How could you say global? Simple. Turn now to Revelation 13. Hit the leather skin and move back to Revelation 13. Last book of your Bible. Revelation 13. Again, prophetic. Spoken before it comes to pass. Stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast right out of the sea. The picture here is coming out of the nations. Having seven heads, ten horns, those ten kings again. Upon his ten horns, crowns upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, combined of these previous empires, feet like a bear, mouth as a lion. And the dragon, which we learn in chapter 12, is the devil, Satan, gave him his power. So a demonically empowered government is coming that's going to try and take over the world. His seat and his great authority came from the dragon. I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death. So when you see a rising world leader, one way you'll know he's the final world leader is he will survive an assassination attempt. And it was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, this antichrist. They worshiped the dragon, Satan, which gave power unto the, e the beast, the antichrist. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Power was given to him to continue. Here it is again, three and a half years, 42 months, times time and half a time. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Israel would be back in the land. Power was given him over all kindred, tongue, nations. That would be a global government. All that dwell upon the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anybody's paying attention, pay attention. That's a rough translation. If any man has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that is killed with the sword must be killed with the sword. But here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, again, rising out from among the nations. He had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon, false prophet. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and they that dwell in therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We will see a global government attempt. We will see a global religion attempt. And one of the ways you fall into that global religion is you have a falling away within the church. He will do great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Not only will there be this false prophet, there will be false miraculous signs. He will deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of the miracles which he has power to do in the sight of the beast. He will say to those that dwell on the earth that they may make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. To give power and to give life to the image that it will both speak and cause all as many as would not worship the image of the beast that they should be killed. And then verse 16, and he causes all small and great, rich or poor, free and bond to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. No man might buy or sell save that he had the mark. So we're going to see global government or an attempt at it. We're going to see some sort of a global leader. And he's going to institute through deception a global financial system. That's coming. Well, how do we know it's going to happen? Because Israel will be back in the land. Now listen, please understand something. This is written 2,000 years ago. How do you get a global government 2,000 years ago? How do you get a global financial system 2,000 years ago? Well, pastor, you know, this is kind of a stretch. Okay, last thing. Revelation 11. Revelation 11, declaring things that are not yet done. During this time, God will send two prophets. Revelation 11, 4, the two olive trees, the two candlesticks that stand before God, these two prophets. There'll be two witnesses. They power, they prophesy, sorry. 
1,260 days or three and a half years. If any man tries to hurt them, verse 5, fire proceeds out of their mouth. They can call it down like Elijah devours their enemy. If any man will hurt them, must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, like Elijah. They have power to turn water to blood, like Moses, to smite the earth with all plagues, like Moses, as often as they will. When they have finished their testimony, the beast, again, this antichrist that ascends out of the bottomless pit, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Okay, well, what's so prophetic about this? Keep reading. Their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That would be Jerusalem. They of the people and the kindreds and the tongues, that means everybody, and the nations shall what? See their dead bodies three and a half days. They will not suffer or allow their dead bodies to be put in, into graves. They that dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts to one another because the two prophets that tormented them that dwell on the earth. After the three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear, upon, fear fell upon all which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies all around the world beheld them. 100 years ago, this was impossible. 50 years ago, pretty much impossible. 1981, Global News, CNN. Still, not everybody, but at least those with cable. Some of you have never known a world without cable. Some of you have never known a world without high-def TV. <laughs> Some of us grew up with, like, no-def TV. <laughs> Rabbit ear and aluminum foil TV. It's really only been the last few years that virtually everyone has some kind of access to a small handheld device that can stream live video. Why am I telling you this? Well, the technology for global government, global financial system, is really pretty much here. The technology for all the world to see two prophets dead in the streets in real time has only really recently been attained, and they're still working on bringing broadband technology to developing countries. And they're working hard. Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, he's working hard, as well as Google and others. They're working hard to bring broadband to the remotest parts of the earth. They have no idea they're basically being used to bring this to pass. You're in a generation that has never seen this kind of capability before sitting in the hands of, quote, average men and women. Back in the land, nation born in a day, we know Russia and others are going to attack them. That prophecy is 2,500 years old. We know what's coming. Russia is going to become increasingly destabilized, as they, at least from an aggression point of view. As they do that, they will seek to consolidate their power. They will eventually go into the Middle East. Israel sitting on all kinds of gas reserves. We also suspect oil, not to mention phenomenal military technology, not to mention they're the only reason the entire Middle East hasn't gone crazy, because they're the anchor that is holding it all together. And so this is all on the cusp of coming to pass. And by the way, somewhere in all this, the ecclesia is going to be suddenly removed. So I tell you these things simply because when you read 1 Corinthians 4, don't read it so casually you miss over what he's telling us. Let's go back and look at it again. Let no man account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You understand from reading your Bible more than Daniel understood because you have revelation, as far as I can tell, more than, for example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob could understand unless God gave them some sort of special revelation. You have the end and what's coming. You know what's ahead. Shouldn't be a surprise. So not only was Paul a minister of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God, but you are as well. You have all kinds of opportunities to strike up conversations with people. What do you mean? Hey, do you notice Israel's back in the land? Well, duh. You know, that's a prophecy. It is. Start at it. Moreover, it's required in stewards, verse 2, that a man be found Faithful. Interesting. Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 2, said, commit these things unto faithful men. Not popular, not well-educated, not eloquent speakers, not rich, not whatever, faithful. 
What does God need from us? Faithfulness. Commit these things to faithful stewards, faithful men. Moreover, in stewards, it's required that a man be found faithful. God's looking for two things from you. One, availability. Two, be faithful. Well done, good and faithful servant. You make yourself available. You have a heart to want to be faithful. Does that mean you'll get everything right? No. He'll use you. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself or nothing against myself. Yet I'm not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Three kinds of judgment. One, man's, and it's limited to what they can see and understand. Two, self-judgment, and face it. At times, we're pretty bogus on our own judgment, aren't we? Three, the one judgment that really matters and is true and accurate, and that is God's judgment, which we talked about last week for his people. I know nothing against myself, but I'm not justified by this. He that judges me is the Lord. Verse five, therefore judge nothing before the time. You know, we're so quick to judge, aren't we? We are so quick to judge. Well, maybe you guys aren't. But we're so quick to judge. How much of the information do we really know? Usually, very little. Paul admonished this church, judge nothing before the time. By the way, this ties back to our previous chapter. You see, you could have wood, hay, stubble. Did you know you can build some really big things out of wood? How many know that? Say an ark. You can get some giant piles of stubble. A lot of hay. And so to the world, it looks like, wow, that is happening. Whoa. But before God, it's nothing left. How often have you judged something by size or so-called worldly success and said, well, that must be happening. And yet when it comes before the eyes of flame of fire before the Lord, it's going to be nothing left. Judge nothing before the time. There'd be ministries that look like they're, they're internationally known. Author, but, and meanwhile, they may end up with zero. And here's the, the man or the woman who faithfully prayed for God's servants in the field missionaries who ends up with the nugget. He does not judge as we judge. His judgment is a right and a true, true judgment. And this Corinthian church was making lots of judgments. I like Paul. I like Apollos. He preaches better. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. You just learned another thing. The Lord's coming, Right? He's going to sit on his holy hill. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to defeat the Antichrist. How do we know he's coming? There'll be Israel back in the land, attempts at global government. Uh, look, terms like global warming, yeah. Global economy, yeah. If you're old enough, you didn't hear that long ago. Now it's commonplace. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, no matter how hard you try to keep them dark, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Manifest the counsels of the hearts. Why did you do this? What was the purpose? What was the reason? Was this to serve the Lord? Or was this ultimately to serve yourself? He's going to bring all of that to light. Then shall every man have praise of God. Now listen, these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos. I beat us up, us up for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. You want a great chance to check that out. Read Ecclesiastes 7. How many days in a week? Seven. What book? How many days in a week? What book? Now you know what to read when you get home. You'll remember it. Not to think above men which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. Who makes you to differ from another? What have you that you have not, or let me try to get, what hast thou that thou did not receive as far as gifting or anything else you have? Now, if you received it, whether the breath, your next breath is a gift of God. You weren't thinking about breathing the whole morning, were you? Everything you have. What do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory or boast 
as if you had not received it, especially in things spiritual. Has God gifted every one of you who are a believer? How many are sure of that? Okay, good. Where did the gift come from? From God. Who deserves the credit and the glory when you use it? God. Who will help you to do it? God. It's, all, it's like allowance. Remember that, the setup? Okay. So if you've received it, why do you boast about it? As if you had not received it. You are merely the instrument. But he gets on this church. Now you are full. You're rich. Again, plutocrats, the word. You've reigned. They've arrived as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign, you Corinthians, that you might, we might also reign with you. For I think that God has set forth the apostles last. And that's interesting. There came the patriarchs. Then there came the priesthood. Then prophets. Then kings and prophets with the kings. And eventually revealing the, where, the words and the plans of God came through the apostles. They really are the last. They're the caboose of the revelation of God, the apostles. He's revealed us last. He's got a point there. He set us forth last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, to angels and to men. That's how we're treated. Interesting, the word used there, when an emperor conquered, or when a military leader conquered, a general or whatever, they would come back to Rome, and they would have a victory parade. And the conquering general would be in front, the military's behind him, Next comes all the spoil, the things they've captured. Last come the captives. And as they get close to Rome there, they would have the incense going and the music and everything else. And so the people in the front would go, <sighs> victory. The people at the back would go, <sighs> oh no. Because the captives were brought into Rome and then cast into the arena to fight animals and gladiators. And Paul picks up on the same thing in chapter Two of Second Corinthians and says, to some were savor of death unto death, to some of life unto life. Same incense, same aroma. But to those who are conquerors in Christ, it's victory. To those who've rejected him, it's coming judgment. He said, we apostles are last. We're treated like a spectacle, like prisoners taken for the arena, to the world, to angels, to men. We're fools for Christ's sake. Obviously, we gave up everything to follow him. But you're wise in Christ, and we are weak. This church has had many opinions. You are strong, you're honorable, and yet they're dissing Paul's ability as, as an apostle and comparing him to others. You're honorable, but we are despised. See, we're fools because even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst while they're all living large in Corinth, naked, scantily clothed, not properly attired, buffeted, beaten, treated brutally. We have no certain dwelling place. Hey, remember when Jesus promised that? Master, master, I'll follow wherever you go. And he said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. If you'd like to see that applied, go to John's gospel, read the end of chapter seven, beginning of chapter eight. They're having an argument. The priesthood then, everyone went to his own home, John chapter eight, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. He was staying outside. Paul, like his master, said, we have no certain dwelling place. We're all over the place. We labor, which the Greeks despised, working with our own hands. And the Romans also, that was a job for slaves in their mind. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, and that still goes on around the world, doesn't it? Would to God North Korea would finally open the borders. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Not we overthrow the government. Not we throw a cog, you know, wrench in the cog of the, the civil society or anything else. We suffer it. Interesting. Being defamed, blasphemed, we entreat. We're made as the filth of the world. We're like the offscouring of all things under this day. When they had plagues in the old days and someone in the house got sick, you know what they did to you? Three in the street. The idea was you were the offscouring. Better to throw you in the street than the rest of the family. Do you know who ministered to them? The early church, to the people in the streets. We're like offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you at Corinth, who are so busy judging whether or not I'm a real apostle. I added that. But as my beloved sons, I warn you of what? Their pride and their arrogance. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Remember, I planted, 
Apollos watered. I was the one who risked his neck to come into town and share the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. Literally, mimic me. You know, the Sunday school teachers learn a lot about you guys. When they see like your daughter in the hallway going, Johnny, you get into class this instant. They go, mm hmm. Where did she learn that? Now, when your kids mimic good things from you or your life or your home or your marriage, that's like, yes. When they mimic the bad things, you, you're kind of like, stop that, stop that. Where'd they learn that? If you're honest. Dads, is your walk worth mimicking by your sons? That doesn't mean you always get it right. But is it worth them mimicking? Moms? Is your walk worth mimicking by your daughters? Hadn't thought of it that way. They are catching way more than what you teach. They are catching how you behave. That's a challenge. By the way, grandkids too. Paul was able to say, mimic me. That is amazing. Follow my walk as I follow Christ. I beseech you be followers of me. For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, Timothy, who is my beloved son, the ideas in the faith, faithful in the Lord, which he was looking for, faithful men, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. As I teach everywhere in every church, you guys were an exception, same standard. Now some of you are puffed up, as though I would not come to you. They've been totally trashing Paul's apostleship, thinking he wouldn't dare show up. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will. Hey, wait a second. Remember James, go to you rich men. You who say we'll go to such and such in city, we'll buy and sell for a year and get great gain. What do you know? Your life is but a vapor. You should say if the Lord wills, James 4, then we'll go do these things. What do you know? Paul got the same lesson. If the Lord will, here in verse 19. Then I will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but I'll show up and know the power. Ooh. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Changed lives godly behavior. And yes, at times, miracles. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love? Which one would you rather have? Hopefully you're all still the love crowd. Shall I come to you in a spirit of meekness? Now, if you've ever read this saying, what's with the verse 21? What's with the, he's going to show up and spank him. What the, what the, chapter 5. It's there for a reason in context. I'm about to show up and clean house, Paul said. Why? Because it's commonly reported among you somebody's involved in family incest and you people aren't dealing with it. But that is next week's topic. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, interesting times we live in. No other generation would have to say unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. That technology exists in quite a few militaries. We see what's going on, Lord. And not only will they run to and fro and knowledge will greatly increase, but we're warned elsewhere in the word, ever learning, yet never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They can Google everything and anything, but they are missing the Savior. And we may well be that final generation to stand in the gap. Which means the stakes are way higher than we ever thought. Little wonder why the devil wants to discourage your people, tempt them and entice them, sidetrack them in sin, give them weight so they can't run that race with endurance scramble their minds so they can't think clearly on your word. Little wonder we're under such assault. But thank you, Lord, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will raise up a standard against him. And so, Lord, we ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit to fall upon your church. Who is sufficient for these things? But our sufficiency is in Christ. And so, God, make us sufficient. Pour out upon us, Lord, so people can tell we've one been with Jesus and we didn't get this from ourselves. This is God working through us. That you might get the glory and the power and the honor and the praise. Lord, help your people be on fire, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.